Hello and welcome to Brains and Bibles. My name is Joel Willoughby, founder of Brains and Bibles, and I'm so proud to bring you another morsel of high quality theology. Now, this is part two in my series here. So if you have not seen part one, make sure you go back and see part one first. That would be very crucial, especially in this series. Uh, but the whole series is called, How Did We Get So Many Bible Translations? That's an important question. Um, so in America here, you have your choice of hundreds of translations. How did this happen? Um, how can you pick the right one? Uh, talk about all those sort of things. So make sure you watch part one. You might even need a refresher, you know, learn, learn terms and things. Uh, but here we go. Part two. Um, I'm just going to dig right into it, just jump right in. But I will say real quick, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the videos you like. Interact with some comments below. You can follow my Facebook page. Check out my website, things like that. Have at it, have fun. Hey, let's get back into the text of the text. Okay, here we go. Uh, well, last time we kind of left off talking about textual criticism a little bit. Well, I just said that was a thing. Um, so here we go. Is textual criticism helpful? That's a good question. Well, when I first heard the phrase textual criticism, um, I thought that's definitely a bad thing. Um, th these are evil people that are doing this because you know they are criticizing the text of Scripture. And that is not good. Uh, it's also not what they're doing. So uh, not technically, not in a bad way. Um, textual criticism. Uh, it's something that has existed even before it was applied to the New Testament. Um, it's a discipline that was practiced anytime there's the doubt of original writing. So um, it goes to the New Testament because we don't have the original writings, the autographs. Remember that term? Uh, the old manuscripts, the original ones are called autographs. And we don't have any of those. Uh, and we have all these different manuscripts, thousands of them. And sometimes there is a variant or a variation, a disagreement between a couple texts. And you have to decide, well, which is right? Which one's right? You know, uh, most of the time they're not significant differences at all by any means, uh, most of the time. And so you have to decide, though, which one of these is correct. And that's called textual criticism, just figuring out what the original would have been. Um, I'd say this is a healthy practice. It is helpful. It's a healthy practice, finding value in knowing exactly what God inspired. Uh, at least that's the pursuit. Okay, So it's not destroying, but rather celebrating the inspiration and preservation of Scripture. Textual criticism is valuable because we know the original completed documents were inspired. So it's a worthwhile task because God has preserved his word. So in other words, if we didn't really think that he had inspired Scripture then what's the point? If we don't think that he actually preserves scripture, then again, what's the point? But we, we believe both those things, so it actually is uh, a, a worthwhile pursuit, textual criticism. But I do want to offer uh, a word of caution, and this would go for anybody and everybody. Uh, this is what I think about when I get involved in this kind of study. Uh, two things. Number one, I dare not say Something that is the word of God is actually not the word of God. I would not want to make that mistake. That would be horrible. Um, likewise, though, I dare not say that something that is not the word of God is the word of God. So that becomes rather significant. I do want to be careful. So we want to be um, just be careful with our words and what we choose. And you may say, I think that this is best. Uh, but be very selective if you say this is the word of God and this is not the word of God. So just be very careful. Okay, so why are there so many translations of the Bible? Now that we've gotten all the background stuff out of the way uh, with part one and what I just said, then now we're actually going to start asking that question and we're going to see a little more. This is the foundation of it all. So one big reason that there is differences is the uh, text family or the text type. Is what it's called. Um, so since there are these variants, these differences between the manuscripts, okay, um, then people will say, well, I choose this one and not this one. And then they go to another set and they say, well, I choose this one and not this one. And so now you have all the ones you don't choose, a pile over here, so to speak, and then you have all these that you do choose. And so this is your text type, your text family. And there are different sets of these text families, okay? Um, so to keep it simple, I'll list the most popular of these. Um, almost all English translations, by the way, today come from what's called the critical text. That's a uh, text type, a text family called the critical text. 
It's a mix uh, mainly of the earliest manuscripts. So the, the big philosophy there is that um, if it's earlier, it is closest to the original, which would more often be most accurate. Okay, that's the big idea. And once again, keeping it all simple, it goes. It's a little. It's a little beyond that. Um, but every modern translation, except for the King James and the New King James, come from this critical text family. Pretty interesting. And we're going to talk about them a little bit here next. So then there's the majority text or the Byzantine text. And um, that's a mix of the manuscripts that have the most agreement. So the other one's like, well, it doesn't matter so much what it says to some extent. Okay. Um, we're just going to choose the earliest ones. And that's, once again, very simplified. It does go beyond that. And in the same sense, oversimplified, it goes beyond this. But the majority, the Byzantine text kind of says it doesn't matter really what it says. If it's repeated the most, that's what we're going to choose. Okay. Th those are the big ideas anyways. Um, so that's that text family. So if it's repeated the most among the extant manuscripts, that's what they're choosing for the majority text. Okay, it's in the majority of the text. Um, so then technically, uh, there actually has not been one translation that's been purely from the majority text. The New King James Version would be the closest to that, uh, but not purely. Okay, uh, so then you have uh, a famous group called the Received Text, or the, the Latin name that, that became famous, the Texas Receptus, okay? Uh, which is kind of a marketing term there. Um, hey, it's the Received Text. You should receive it too, right? Okay, so the Texas Receptus, or Received Text, uh, this is different from the majority text um, and has nearly 30 distinct editions, okay? And, there, and there's multiple editions of a lot of things. Um, but just, there's some confusion there because a lot of times when someone talks about the Texas Receptus received text or TR, you'll hear that phrase as well, the TR. Um, then they'll, they'll, sometimes the people think there's only one edition or they think there's maybe only a couple, but there's actually nearly 30. So it's an interesting fact there. The one uh, edition that was used in connection with the King James Version was the fifth edition of that Texas Receptus. Uh, in 1633 is when the phrase uh, in Latin was coined Texas Receptus, okay, translating received text. I'm going to discuss that more later. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get back into that another time. So let's move on. Uh, of course, popular translations from this Texas Receptus uh, would be Luther's Bible, Tyndale's Bible, and of course the King James Version. So then, that's one thing, the text type, the text family. Second thing. Another task is to choose a translation philosophy, a translation philosophy. So there's, there's a big two, dynamic equivalency and formal equivalency. Coffee good. Okay. Dynamic equivalency. Now, this is uh, the more thought-for-thought thought translation. So think of it this way. If um, someone that speaks a different native language was on the telephone, cell phone nowadays, right? But And um, they're speaking that native language. You don't speak that language. You're kind of listening. They get done with the phone call. Click. Okay. And you say, hey, what did you guys talk about? And uh, that, that person could tell you in your English language, you know, this is what we said. Da, 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 da. And they're being truthful. They're being honest. Okay. But it's not word for word what was said. It's But it's what was said. That's kind of the idea. So no, no blasphemy here necessarily. Um, all they're doing is the translators are seeking to understand the original language and what that is. And then they give that understanding in modern words. So the, the, the same idea. Uh, so still being honest in everything. Um, the benefit is easier reading usually. The more thought for thought is the more smooth, easy reading. Uh, but sometimes at the cost of the original words. Okay. Then there's formal equivalency, which is um, a more word-for-word -word translation, so more rigid word-for-word, -word, okay? Um, there's the closest we get to a very word-for-word -word translation would be like uh, the original American Standard Version. In the more uh, like thought-for-thought -thought translation, so remember word-for-word -word is formal equivalency, thought-for-thought -thought is dynamic equivalency. So the more thought-for-thought -thought we like um, the NASB, okay? Uh, that that would be more so, uh, but usually it's just like uh, a mix. It's a certain mix of these things. 
there really is no complete word for word translation uh, because there's things like idioms. Uh, we're we're going to talk about that here in a moment. So we'll hold on to that. Okay. So translators are just trying to be more honest to the actual original word. So word for word, uh, sometimes a little more rigid, but um, you know more of what's actually there in the original Hebrew Greek text. Okay. So then um, there are words that don't exist in every language, right? Um, so how do you handle that? There's idioms, cultural phrases uh, that don't exist and so uh, in other languages. So how do you handle that, right? So let me give you an example so you understand what I'm talking about. Um, John 2, 4, the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 4. Jesus is speaking to his mother, Mary, and he asks literally, you know, for a direct word-for-word -word translation, you, he would say, what to me and to you? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> I don't know. I have no clue what that means. Uh, what to me and to you? Um, yes, you got me there. Well, that's an idiom. That's an idiom from their language, culture, that sort of thing. And so uh, what? how do you handle that? So you understand the meaning of it originally. So we smooth it out to be something like this. What does this have to do with me? Okay, now we can understand that. Okay. Uh, of course, that's the you know wedding of Cana, water and wine. Um some people enjoy that narrative a little more than others. Okay, uh, next up. This is still um, being true to the text, okay? Um, so I, I, I like it. Like So words like Alleluia, Amen, and Satan are transliterated into the Greek New Testament. So there's not there was not a word in that Koine Greek language. And so what do you do? Well, they did a transliteration. What that means is you take the sound of that Hebrew word, um, and then you would you would just use the Greek letters to make the same sound. So like Satan would be Satan, right? You use the same kind of letters there. Um, maybe a little bit of a different pronunciation of the vowels slightly uh, as things change between languages. Um, so amen, right? Uh, it was aman, aman in Hebrew. And so they popped it into the Greek as um, amen. And uh, we popped it into English as amen, right? And so it has the idea of faithful and true. Uh, that's the idea of amen. Okay. Uh, so a transliteration, copying of the sound of the original word into the translated language. You'd also see like cherub, cherubim, seraphim, um, that kind of thing, nephilim, you know, depending on your Bible. And those are all Hebrew words. Okay. So I think it's more honest because it's like, well, what is that thing? It, it, I, I like it. I am definitely more for the formal equivalency. Um, I gotta say, so, but you know, you, you, no matter how formal you are, you still have a thought for thought idea when it comes to certain things. So there's some extent that you have to, um, but I try to do word for word as much as possible. Now, next outside of this, okay. The text families and the translation philosophies, why there's so many translations. So there's, there's actually more here. Uh, a big one I want to talk to you about is theological bias and we'll end with this one. Okay. And then we'll, we'll pick it up part three uh, in two weeks here, next, next go around. Okay, so uh, there's theological bias. You have to be aware of this. No matter how non-biased a person tries to be, we all have a bias. You have to be aware of it. Um, we, we all still have these unshakable foundations, um, just background ideas. Uh, when we been, begin to work with translation, um, or you could say in interpretation, but, but here's just, you know, here's something extra for you. Uh, translation is interpretation. That's the same thing. Translation is interpretation. When you take one language and you bring it over to another, you, you are saying what the meaning is. That's so it's interpretation. Okay. Some people think there's translation without interpretation. That's impossible. Uh, it, it is one and the same thing. It can't be avoided, this theological bias. So the safety is knowing what your theological bias is so you can guard yourself to make sure you know you are actually accurately identifying the truths in the Word of God. But then also when you have a translation, you want to identify what that theological bias is. Um, so I would say like, so the English Standard Version ESV, I use that uh, mostly. And that's what I've been using for this uh, these Brains and Bibles videos here. And that is from the critical text, and it is a uh, formal equivalency, so word for word. 
um, when it when it can be, uh, which I really like that. Uh, and then they also have, I, I would say, a, a reformed bias, uh, reformed theology, which um, I don't really um, parts of that I don't I don't get into. I don't make a part of my own doctrinal uh, stand. I'll say it that way. And so, uh, but I but I like the I like the Bible. I like the way they translate a lot of things. And so, just knowing that that is there, it, it helps me have some discernment, and I just walk through it carefully that way. Um, and you just have to know where each Bible is coming from, and hopefully I can help you out with all that through this series, okay? Uh, so then there could be this um, burden to do better in certain areas. So uh, we think about why there's so many different translations. Someone's reading translations, and they think to themselves, well, I think they really could have done better here, or do better there, or they have their own theological bias, right? And so they, they want to make sure there's uh, better scholarship, or there's uh, you might have access to more or better manuscripts than some other people had, um, and they just have access to it for, for one reason or another. Uh, it could be a combination of those things, you know, just kind of applying these different um, ideas here and there. Uh, and so I think actually the biggest reason, though, is money. And uh, I'll start there next time, okay? The biggest reason, I think, is money, unfortunately. Um, and we'll talk about that. Some of the, um, there's some myths there. And so some misconceptions, we'll clear that up. Okay, so hopefully this is helping you out. Uh, there's actually a lot more information to still get to, uh, but I think already you have a, a probably a pretty good foundation uh, for understanding the many different translations out there. Okay, why there's so many English translations? Okay, I think you're starting to understand. What I would really love to see is more Bible translation work. And a lot of people say, why do we have all these English things? We don't have all these other things. Well, you have to learn those languages, and uh, you have to get people out in the field, and it, it's a big process. Um, but you can help support some of those ministries. You can look them up. Um, there's lots of different kinds, and they have different philosophies and things, and so you can check that out. But yeah, Bible translation is an important work, um, and uh, it probably doesn't get the attention it deserves. So hopefully, uh, through this series, it will get some better attention, and hopefully you can think a little bit more about that translation you hold in your hand. Um, and uh, to see what might work best for you. Hey, thanks for tuning in to Brains and Bibles. I really appreciate uh, your support. Make sure you pray for the ministry, uh, that God would use it, and, uh, and me personally as well. Thank you so much for your participation.